Hello, welcome to Nanomaterials in the Environment. My name is Pete Rayner, and I am an Associate Professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota. The objectives for this module are that, by the end, learners should be able to identify sources for engineered nanomaterials in the natural environment, describe potential ecological effects of nanomaterials, predict pathways for exposure of the public to nanomaterials, and assess human exposure to engineered nanomaterials in the environment. This drawing from Sun and co-authors shows the basic stages in the life cycle of engineered nanomaterials. The production of raw engineered nanomaterials and the fabrication and use of nanomaterial-enabled products lead to nanomaterials in waste streams as well as direct releases to the natural environment. In addition, engineered nanomaterials may be released from waste streams into the natural environment. In this lesson, we will consider the ecological risks posed by these nanomaterials and the magnitude of human exposures to nanomaterials released into the ecosphere. We will find that, in general, human exposures to nanomaterials in the natural environment are likely to be low, especially when compared to some occupational exposures, but that the ecological risks are uncertain because we have limited measurements of environmental concentrations of engineered nanomaterials. Novak and co-authors conceptualize transformation processes for engineered nanomaterials in a very useful 2012 paper. After raw, or pristine, nanomaterials are produced, they are frequently modified in industrial processes as they are incorporated into products. Common modifications include changes to hydrophilic hydrophobic properties, surface charge, and surface reactivity to allow the particles to be evenly dispersed into a solid or liquid matrix. These changes may alter the toxicity of the engineered nanomaterials. These product-modified engineered nanomaterials may be modified further with time as the product ages and experiences weathering and other processes. If and when these product-weathered nanomaterials are released from the product into the environment, they may be transformed again over time as they move through and reside in different environmental media, such as air, water, or soil. Our knowledge of the effects of aging, weathering, and environmental transformations on the chemical and toxicological properties of engineered nanomaterials is limited at this point. More information about whether these transformations generally make engineered nanomaterials more or less reactive than they are in their pristine and product-modified states would help us to understand the ecological and human health risks that they pose in the environment. Novak and co-authors list eight important processes that can transform engineered nanomaterials. Photochemical transformation, oxidation, reduction, dissolution and precipitation, adsorption and desorption, combustion, biotransformation or biodegradation, and abrasion. In their paper, they consider the transformations that several different engineered nanomaterials may undergo as they are released from products into waste streams and the natural environment. One of the engineered nanomaterials that Novak et al. consider is carbon nanotubes incorporated into nanocomposites. Hearth and co-authors illustrate the chemical and mechanical transformations to carbon nanotube nanocomposites that may lead to their release to the natural environment. On the vertical axis, effects of chemical transformations such as exposure to ultraviolet radiation and chemicals that break down the material in which the carbon nanotubes are held will increase the risk of carbon nanotube release. Similarly, on the horizontal axis, mechanical processes such as sanding, shredding, and normal consumer use can make the nanotubes more likely to be released, especially if the product has already experienced chemical transformations. Some processes such as drilling and plastics compounding expose nanocomposite materials to high temperatures that may release the nanotubes. Ultimately, released carbon nanotubes may themselves decompose in the environment to other forms of carbon. Novak and co-authors drew this diagram for transformation processes for carbon nanotubes in nanocomposites. The nanotube-enabled products could be disposed of at the end of use in the solid waste stream via landfilling, where the products might experience adsorption and desorption, biotransformations, or oxidation, or via incineration, where the products and probably the nanotubes themselves will be broken down by combustion. As nanocomposite products are used, Nanotubes can be released by photochemical transformations, biodegradation, or abrasion of the nanocomposite. 
Abrasion processes could include sanding, shredding, and drilling of the product. Carbon nanotubes released from the nanocomposite could make their way into wastewaters, where they could experience adsorption and desorption and biotransformations, or they could be released into the natural environment, as could nanotubes emerging from the various disposal pathways. In the natural environment, carbon nanotubes could experience photochemical transformations, oxidation reactions, adsorption and desorption processes, and biotransformation or biodegradation. Clearly, there are many pathways by which the nanotubes might be released into the environment, and an array of ways in which the engineered nanomaterial-enabled products and the nanomaterials themselves may be transformed after their release. What does it look like when a carbon nanotube nanocomposite breaks down by weathering? Gwynn and co-authors created a nanocomposite from an epoxy resin containing embedded multi-walled carbon nanotubes. They then exposed their test material to high-energy ultraviolet radiation, 480 watts per square meter, at 50 degrees Celsius and 75% relative humidity for 43 days in an accelerated aging test. This figure from their paper shows images of the surface of the nanocomposite material taken at several intervals during the test. The multi-walled carbon nanotubes start to become visible after 11 days of accelerated aging and the concentration of the nanotubes at the surface increases over time. By the end of the test period, the surface appears to be a mat of carbon nanotubes. This second image illustrates what happens during this accelerated aging. Initially, the nanotubes are fully embedded within the nanocomposite. The exposure to ultraviolet radiation breaks down the epoxy polymer and the breakdown products leave in the gas phase. The carbon nanotubes are left behind, and as more of the polymer breaks down, more and more of the nanotubes are left at the surface of the weathered nanocomposite. With sufficient mechanical agitation, it is not difficult to imagine that some of the multi-wall carbon nanotubes might be released from the weathered nanocomposite. In fact, in a similar study, Hearth et al. were able to show the release of individual carbon nanotubes from artificially weathered nanocomposite materials. These authors created polyurethane multi-walled carbon nanotube nanocomposites. The test materials were exposed to 111 watts per square meter of ultraviolet radiation at 65 degrees Celsius for four weeks to simulate nine months of weathering by sunlight. In parallel tests, the materials were exposed to a standard humidity and precipitation cycle to simulate nine months of weathering by rain. After these artificial weathering tests, the samples were agitated in a number of ways to determine if free nanotubes could be released. The image on the left shows a free nanotube released after the test material weathered with ultraviolet radiation was agitated for 30 seconds using an ultrasonic probe. The image on the right shows a free nanotube released from the test material weathered with artificial rain cycles after ultrasonic agitation. While these are laboratory observations under highly controlled conditions, the experiments show the potential for releases of carbon nanotubes into the natural environment after engineered nanomaterial products experience weathering followed by mechanical stresses. As we will see shortly, Novak and co-authors also consider the potential for release of nanosilver from socks. The figures on this page from Metrano et al. demonstrate the potential for silver to be released from fabrics containing nanosilver. The authors prepared test fabrics and then washed them once or repeatedly in a detergent with no oxidizing agents and a detergent with an oxidizing agent. They subsequently applied a toxicity characteristic leaching procedure, or TCLP, to the washed fabrics to determine if additional silver might leach out upon landfilling of the socks. The figures show the mass of silver present per mass of fabric on the vertical axes versus test conditions on the horizontal axes. The figure on the left shows results for fabrics treated with 100 nanometer silver particles, whereas the figure on the right is for fabrics treated with 60 nanometer particles. Washing clearly removed silver from the fabrics. In all cases, 10 washes removed more silver than a single wash cycle. The detergent with the oxidizing agent removed more silver than the detergent with no oxidizing agent. More silver was removed from fabrics with the 60 nanometer particles than ones with 100 nanometer particles. 
In general, the TCLP protocol suggested that silver might still leach from the treated fabrics if they were deposited in a landfill even after 10 wash cycles. As they did for carbon nanotube nanocomposites, Novak and co-authors created a diagram for transformation processes for socks that contain nanosilver. Silver can be released very rapidly from the socks during washing by oxidation, dissolution, desorption, and abrasion. Most of the released silver will end up in wastewater, where it can be transformed photochemically or by oxidation, dissolution, adsorption and desorption, and biotransformations. If wastewater treatment is not fully effective on silver, some of it will reach the natural environment. In addition, socks will end up in the solid waste stream to be incinerated or landfilled, potentially leading to additional releases of silver to the environment. Once in the natural environment, silver is likely to undergo a wide range of further transformations. Other authors have investigated the potential for releases of nanosilver from test fabrics during washing. Geranio and co-authors measured the release of silver from fabric containing nanosilver in a washing machine using a standardized test protocol. The table shows that substantial releases of nanosilver can occur and that the amount released decreases during a second washing cycle. Not surprisingly, the largest releases on an absolute basis were for fabrics that contain more silver to begin with. In this figure on the right, the releases during the first washing cycle are separated into particles larger than 450 nanometers, particles smaller than 450 nanometers, and silver ions. For all except one of the test fabrics, most of the released silver was in particles larger than 450 nanometers, suggesting that the applied silver is not really nanosilver, or that the silver particles are agglomerated. The plasma NP fabric was the only one known to use silver particles approximately 100 nanometers in mean diameter. Therefore, it is not surprising that less of its released mass was larger than 450 nanometers. Why might engineered nanomaterial-enabled products thought to be made from pristine nanoparticles smaller than 100 nanometers in diameter release much larger particles? Caballero Guzman and Novak assert that pristine particles are likely to grow in size as they are used and then released into the environment because they aggregate, agglomerate, and attach themselves to larger particles. The impact of these processes is illustrated in these particle size distributions that show how nanomaterial sizes might increase from when nanomaterials are produced to when they are used in products to when they are present in the environment. These size transformations are likely to change the behavior of the nanomaterials in the environment as well as their interactions with ecosystems and people. Titanium dioxide nanoparticles are used in products that may release the nanoparticles into the natural environment. The image on the left from Wokovich and co-authors shows a scanning electron microscope image of a sunscreen containing nanotitanium dioxide. The sunscreen was dried in a vacuum. The image shows that most of the titanium dioxide nanoparticles have agglomerated to form larger clusters. After people apply sunscreen, they may swim in surface waters and will later shower or bathe, releasing these agglomerated nanoparticles directly into surface waters and wastewater. The image on the right from Kagi and co-authors shows a surface covered with a paint that contains titanium dioxide nanoparticles. The particles are spread across the surface relatively evenly and they are not highly agglomerated. In addition, they appear to be accessible to the atmosphere, leading to the potential for removal from the surface during precipitation events. The nanoparticles could then move with runoff into stormwater systems, surface waters, or soil. Novak et al. created a diagram for processes that may lead to transformations of nanotitanium dioxide particles used in both sunscreens and paints. The products in which the nanoparticles are contained may be released directly to the natural environment through spills, may be poured or washed into wastewaters, or may be sent to landfills. Individual titanium dioxide nanoparticles may be liberated rapidly from applied sunscreens or slowly from painted surfaces after photochemical transformations, oxidation, and abrasion. These individual nanoparticles may eventually reach the natural environment. After their release, the titanium dioxide nanoparticles may experience additional photochemical transformations, dissolution and precipitation, 
adsorption and desorption, and biotransformation or biodegradation. Reed et al. studied the presence of sunscreen chemicals in surface water downstream from a recreational swimming area. They were able to identify higher concentrations of oxybenzone, an organic compound used to absorb UV radiation in some sunscreens, and titanium in waters downstream from the swimming area than in waters upstream from the swimming area. Both figures show concentration as a function of time. The black dots represent upstream concentrations and the colored dots, red in the top figure for oxybenzone and blue in the bottom figure for titanium, represent the downstream concentrations. When swimming took place during the day, downstream concentrations were elevated. The authors recognized that the elevated titanium could be a result of activity in the swimming area stirring up sediments that contain titanium. In these additional figures, the authors were also able to find higher levels of aluminum in green and iron in yellow downstream from the swimming area than upstream. However, when the authors compared upstream and downstream ratios of titanium to aluminum concentrations in light blue and titanium to iron concentrations in pink, they observed higher ratios downstream than upstream, suggesting that at least some of the elevated titanium is caused by releases of titanium dioxide nanoparticles from sunscreens applied by swimmers. In an investigation of titanium dioxide in the runoff from painted surfaces, Kagi et al. observed titanium dioxide nanoparticle aggregates on the left and larger individual nanoparticles on the right embedded in organic binder in the runoff from freshly painted surfaces. The observed individual particles and aggregates were generally larger than 100 nanometers. Similar particles were observed in the runoff from surfaces painted two years previously, although the concentrations of particles in the runoff from the older surface were considerably lower. This figure shows titanium concentrations in the runoff from the freshly painted surface, the runoff from the surface painted two years previously, and in urban runoff waters. The concentrations for the newly painted surface are shown on the left vertical axis, whereas the concentrations for the older surface and the urban runoff are shown on the right vertical axis. The total raw concentration of titanium in the runoff from the freshly painted surface was about 600 micrograms per liter. When the runoff sample was centrifuged to eliminate particles larger than about 300 nanometers, the remaining concentration was about 550 micrograms per liter, indicating that the overwhelming majority of the titanium mass in the runoff was associated with particles in the nanoscale or near nanoscale range. The concentration of titanium in the runoff from the surface painted two years previously was much lower, on the order of 10 micrograms per liter. Again, most of the mass was associated with particles smaller than 300 nanometers in diameter. The concentration of titanium in the urban runoff measured about 16 micrograms per liter, although only about 50% of this mass was associated with particles smaller than 300 nanometers, likely because much of the titanium came from sources other than facades coated with paints containing titanium dioxide nanoparticles. In reviewing 106 articles that they identified regarding the release of engineered nanomaterials from products, Caballero, Guzman, and Novak found that this literature covered less than half of the engineered nanomaterials available and less than half of the product categories in which engineered nanomaterials are utilized. Of these 106 articles, Almost three-quarters were about silver nanoparticles, carbon nanotubes, nanotitanium dioxide, or nanosilica. More than three-quarters of the articles considered the use of engineered nanomaterials in composites, textiles, paints, or plastics. In addition, more than three-quarters of the articles addressed one of four release scenarios, mechanical treatment of a nanoproduct, releases after weathering, leaching from food storage containers, or releases due to washing. This literature review suggests that there is a wide range of engineered nanomaterials and release scenarios that still need to be assessed to fully evaluate the risks posed by human exposures to engineered nanomaterials. When we consider the fate and transport of engineered nanomaterials in the natural environment, we must consider the ability of nanomaterials to reside in various environmental media, air, water, including stormwater, freshwater, groundwater and seawater, sediments, and soil. Let's look at each of these compartments. 
This diagram from Garner and Keller shows the different processes by which engineered nanomaterials can move and transform in the environment. In the air, engineered nanoparticles are likely to attach themselves to other aerosol particles to form aggregates that behave effectively as larger particles. Organic vapors, and inorganic vapors such as water vapor, will be able to condense or adsorb onto the surfaces of airborne nanoparticles or aggregates that contain nanoparticles. Some types of engineered nanoparticles may be able to dissolve partially or completely into droplets in the atmosphere. When aggregates become large enough, they will begin to settle due to gravity. Nanomaterials contained in liquid drops may deposit with precipitation onto soil or water surfaces, which is referred to as wet deposition. In addition, individual engineered nanoparticles and nanoparticles in aggregates may be able to deposit onto soil or water surfaces due to gravitational settling or diffusion processes, which is referred to as dry deposition. Engineered nanoparticles present in the soil have the potential to move into water with runoff from precipitation and by other transport processes such as wind-aided resuspension. If the nanomaterials remain in the soil, they may attach and detach from soil particles. The nanomaterials may dissolve in groundwater, then possibly attach to clay particles and be transported with those clay particles through the soil. Engineered nanoparticles may interact with natural organic materials, with some of these organic materials adsorbing to or reacting with the particle surfaces. The nanoparticles also have the potential to aggregate and move deeper into the soil. In water, engineered nanomaterials may attach themselves to suspended sediment particles, or they may dissolve into the water. Once again, they may interact with natural organic material with some of the material reacting with it or adsorbing to the particle surface. The engineered nanoparticles may be able to aggregate together as well. Eventually, the individual nanoparticles, or the aggregates of which they are a part, will settle due to gravity into the sediment at the bottom of surface waters. Once in the sediment, there is a possibility of resuspension, or else of burial into deeper sediments. This figure shows three modes of particles of different sizes that are commonly present in the outdoor atmosphere. Particles of nanoscale size are formed in nature by gas-to-particle conversions, a process referred to as nucleation. These particles form what is called the nucleation mode. Normally, particles in the nucleation mode do not remain that size. More vapor will deposit on the particles, and the particles will coagulate to form effectively larger particles. They become particles on the order of 100 nanometers to 1 micrometer in size, and collectively they are referred to as the accumulation mode. Particles suspended by the wind or generated from human processes are larger than about 2.5 micrometers and are referred to as the coarse mode. Similar to particles in the nucleation mode, engineered nanoparticles in the atmosphere will not remain as small individual nanoparticles for long. Vapor will condense on their surfaces and they will form aggregates due to coagulation so that they become part of larger particles in the accumulation mode. Particles leave the atmosphere by dry and wet deposition. While particles in the coarse mode are likely to settle due to gravitational sedimentation, particles in the accumulation mode will move with the air and may come close enough to surfaces such as plants, soil, or water to be deposited by gravity or Brownian motion. This is all considered dry deposition. However, particles in the accumulation mode are also likely to be incorporated into cloud droplets and fall with precipitation, or they may be scavenged in the atmosphere by raindrops falling from above. These processes are referred to as wet deposition. The key points regarding the fate of engineered nanoparticles in the atmosphere are that they are likely to become part of larger particles that are no longer in the nanoscale range, and that these larger particles will eventually leave the atmosphere by wet or dry deposition. In the time before they deposit, the particles may be transported considerable distances. When they enter water, engineered nanomaterials can aggregate with each other and with other materials in the water. Buffet and co-authors use this figure to illustrate the most common aggregation processes. A legend for the objects in the figure shows that the small black dots represent solid organic matter, the long thin lines represent biopolymers such as mucopolysaccharides, peptidoglycanes, 
hemicellulose, and pectic compounds from microbial cell walls and extracellular products. And inorganic colloids that will include engineered nanomaterials suspended in the water. Inorganic colloids can form slow-growing aggregates with themselves that take a very long time to grow large enough to settle due to gravity. The same holds true for organic matter and for combinations of inorganic colloids with organic matter. Inorganic colloids can also form aggregates with biopolymers that grow more rapidly and begin to destabilize over time as they become larger, especially when organic matter is present and becomes part of the aggregate. These large three-part aggregates are unstable in suspension and they are prone to sedimentation. Thus, the characteristics of the water body play a significant role in the fate and transport of engineered nanomaterials in aquatic systems. Garner and Keller reviewed the existing literature and classified the time frames required for aggregation of engineered nanomaterials in aquatic systems as a function of material composition and type of water. In stormwater and freshwater, engineered nanomaterials aggregate slowly because of a relative lack of ionic strength and organic matter in the water. Thus, the residence time required for aggregation is long, requiring weeks or months. For groundwater and seawater, which have higher ionic strength and more organic matter, aggregation time is much shorter, requiring only hours or days for many nanomaterials. Zinc oxide nanoparticles, and especially zero-valent iron nanoparticles, are among the engineered nanomaterials most likely to aggregate quickly in many or all of the aquatic systems. Although aluminum oxide nanoparticles were only tested in freshwater, it was the engineered nanomaterial that aggregated most readily in that system. Nanosilica is slow to form aggregates in all of the aquatic systems. Other nanomaterials vary across the different types of water. The same authors classified time frames for sedimentation for various engineered nanomaterials in different types of aquatic systems. The trends were similar, though not identical, to the aggregation time frames. In general, sedimentation was fastest in seawater compared to stormwater, freshwater, and groundwater. Zero-valent iron and iron-2,3 oxide nanoparticles generally showed the fastest sedimentation rates across all of the aquatic systems. However, cerium oxide nanoparticles, multi-walled carbon nanotubes, and nanotitanium dioxide all demonstrated sedimentation time frames of just hours in seawater. According to the same review, the time frame required for engineered nanomaterials to dissolve in various kinds of water ranged from weeks to months for almost all materials. Only zinc oxide nanoparticles showed more rapid dissolution time frames of days or even hours in freshwater and seawater. In addition to these physical processes, engineered nanomaterials can also undergo chemical transformations when suspended in water. The most common transformations are oxidation reactions, sulfidation reactions, and reactions with phosphorus. Oxidation reactions include silver nanoparticles being oxidized to silver ions, which can then combine with free chlorine ions to form a salt. Copper nanoparticles can be transformed to a variety of carbonate or hydroxide complexes. Zero-valent iron nanoparticles can be oxidized to one of several iron oxides, which can release iron ions into the water. In examples of sulfidation reactions, zinc oxide, cadmium, and silver nanomaterials can be transformed to zinc sulfide, cadmium sulfide, and silver sulfide, respectively, in aquatic systems. An example of a reaction with phosphorus in water is transformation of zinc oxide nanoparticles to zinc phosphate. What risks might engineered nanomaterials pose to aquatic life, especially in ocean waters? According to Klein and co-authors, when nanoparticles deposit from the atmosphere onto the ocean surface, the nanomaterials may pose a risk to embryos and plankton that are present in the surface microlayer. Reaerosolization from the surface microlayer may also pose a risk to marine birds and mammals. As engineered nanomaterials aggregate and begin to settle toward the ocean floor, they may pose risks to fish. Once the aggregates reach the sediment, they may pose risks to benthic species, such as mollusks, crustaceans, sea anemones, sponges, and others. Concentrations and effects are likely to vary between coastal sediments and sediments in the deep ocean floor. Klein et al. discussed the possible toxic effects that nanomaterials may have on bacteria. 
For example, engineered nanomaterials used for diagnostic imaging typically target cell membranes for labeling. These nanomaterials have been shown to have the potential to disrupt and damage the cell membrane, even puncturing the membrane in some instances. Engineered nanomaterials may also be able to oxidize or destabilize proteins in bacteria by several different mechanisms. Some nanomaterials have been shown to damage DNA molecules. Many nanomaterials are able to produce reactive oxygen species, which are thought to be able to react with and potentially damage cell membranes, proteins, and DNA. Researchers have shown that fullerenes and cerium oxide nanoparticles have the ability to interrupt electron transport in the cell membrane, inhibiting cellular respiration. Finally, heavy metals and ions that can be released from engineered nanomaterials can be toxic to bacteria. The relative impact of these various mechanisms on the toxicity of engineered nanomaterials to bacteria is still uncertain. Klein and co-authors report the toxic effects of several prevalent kinds of engineered nanomaterials on bacteria. Single-walled carbon nanotubes have antibacterial properties and can cause damage to cell membranes. Multi-walled carbon nanotubes are cytotoxic to microorganisms. Quantum dots may cause oxidative damage to cell membranes in bacteria. Nanosilver is used in products because of its bactericidal and viricidal properties. Gold nanoparticles have relatively low level toxicity, but because they are used so much in medical research and treatments, they may have a significant cumulative effect. Titanium dioxide nanoparticles enhance solar disinfection of microorganisms due to their photocatalytic activity. Nanotitanium dioxide also produces reactive oxygen species. Other metal oxide nanoparticles have antimicrobial impacts. And finally, nanosilica produces mild toxicity by the generation of reactive oxygen species. Garner and Keller reviewed 61 ecotoxicity studies comparing toxicity findings to what is known about concentrations of engineered nanomaterials in both freshwater and seawater systems. The authors do not anticipate that any engineered nanomaterials are sufficiently concentrated in aquatic systems to cause substantial toxicity in most situations unless there is a concentrated source or spill of nanomaterials. When comparing different kinds of nanomaterials in their review, the authors found that silver, zero-valent iron, and zinc oxide nanoparticles have the highest toxicity potential in both freshwater and seawater. Other notable engineered nanomaterials such as carbon nanotubes, fullerenes, cerium oxide nanoparticles, nanotitanium dioxide, and nanosilica exhibit lower levels of toxicity in one or both of the systems. In soil, Klein and co-authors identified a number of key processes by which engineered nanomaterials may move through the soil and cause toxicity. Engineered nanomaterials may be able to dissolve in groundwater, aggregate with soil particles, and migrate through the soil. Nanomaterials have the potential to bioaccumulate in plant material. They can also bioaccumulate in invertebrates such as earthworms, potentially with toxic effects. As with bacteria in aquatic systems, engineered nanomaterials may also be toxic to microorganisms in the soil. Garner and Keller summarize existing data on ecological concerns posed by engineered nanomaterials in soil. Gold and silver nanoparticles are capable of entering terrestrial food webs and bioaccumulating in organisms. Gold, silver, and aluminum oxide nanoparticles have all been shown to be capable of limiting reproduction of a type of earthworm named Isenia fetida. In addition, silver nanoparticles are acutely toxic to Isenia fetida. Copper 2 oxide and iron 2 3 oxide nanoparticles have been shown to alter soil microbial communities. On the other hand, carbon-60 fullerenes have been shown to have little effect on soil microbial communities. All of the relevant studies have been conducted in laboratory settings using soil concentrations that probably do not reflect the real concentrations in soils. We have almost no information on the concentrations of engineered nanomaterials in situ, meaning in place, in real-world soil environments. Thus, we have much to learn still about the potential toxicity of engineered nanomaterials in soils. This diagram from Keller and Lazareva illustrates once again the potential pathways by which engineered nanomaterials may be released into the natural environment.
During production of engineered nanomaterial enabled products, some nanoparticles may be released into the air, some nanomaterials may end up as waste taken to a landfill, and some may be released to wastewater and be processed by wastewater treatment plants. The products themselves will be used by consumers and then disposed of. Use can lead to nanomaterials entering wastewater, and some of the used nanomaterials may end up in air, water, or soil in the natural environment. Solids from wastewater treatment plants, as well as the materials disposed of by consumers, may end up in a waste incineration plant, which may release some nanomaterials into the air, or else they will be landfilled. Some nanomaterials will pass through wastewater treatment plants and end up in water or soil compartments in the environment. Keller and Lazareva estimated the global flow of engineered nanomaterials from production, through use, then disposal, and their ultimate fate. The most prevalent nanomaterials worldwide are nanosilica, nanotitanium dioxide, iron nanoparticles, nano-zinc oxide, and nano-aluminum oxide. These engineered nanomaterials and others are used in a variety of applications, including coatings, paints, and pigments, and personal care products. The authors estimate that approximately 60% of the original nanomaterials will end up in a landfill, with the remaining 40% being released, in one form or another, to the natural environment. The same authors estimate releases by region, with about 50% of releases to landfills, air, water, and soil coming in Asia. Europe is estimated to have the second highest release levels, followed by North America in third place. Overall, nanotitanium dioxide and nanosilica are believed to account for more than half of all releases by mass. The sampling and analysis of engineered nanomaterials from environmental media are challenging for a number of reasons. In particular, concentrations are expected to be low, and the engineered nanomaterials may be hard to distinguish from naturally occurring nanomaterials. Sampling is generally accomplished using standard methods. In water and wastewater, grab samples are taken at desired depths. Similarly, in sediments and soils, samples are dug out from desired depths. Samples from the atmosphere are taken using time-integrated filter or cascade impactor samples. Among the challenges for the occupational hygienist or other health and safety specialists when taking samples is to make sure that the sample is representative of the environmental medium from which it is drawn. This can be a concern, for example, if airborne nanoparticles might deposit due to their Brownian motion in tubing or in the entry to a sampler before reaching the collection medium. Even a small amount of contamination during sampling is a critical problem because concentrations are expected to be very low in environmental samples. The person performing sampling must consider sample preservation and holding time if there is a chance that the composition or morphology of the nanomaterial may change between sampling and analysis. Finally, there is relatively little guidance for those conducting sampling in most cases because few methods have been optimized for engineered nanomaterials. Analytical procedures will be determined based on the goals of whoever performs the sampling. These analytical goals may include measuring engineered nanomaterial concentrations in the air, water, or soil. Concentration may be defined in different metrics, including number concentration, surface area concentration, or mass concentration, which is the most common. Size distribution may be a desirable analytical goal in some situations. Knowing the morphology of the nanomaterial may be of interest. Morphology potentially includes the shape of the nanomaterial, an assessment of particle agglomeration, and the phase or crystalline structure of the nanomaterial. Finally, the chemical composition of the engineered nanomaterial is usually important. In all situations, the workup of the sample, how the sample is processed so that it is put in a form in which it is ready for analysis, is critical especially because concentrations are usually low enough that the limits of detection for many analytical procedures will be challenged. To assess engineered nanomaterial concentrations, size distributions, shape, and amount of agglomeration, imaging techniques such as transmission electron microscopy, or TEM, scanning electron microscopy, or SEM, and atomic force microscopy, or AFM, may be used. To evaluate phase and crystalline structure, electron diffraction, X-ray absorption spectroscopy, or XAS, 
and X-ray diffraction, or XRD, may be used. Chemical composition may be assessed using liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, LCMS, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, ICPMS, or energy dispersive spectroscopy, EDS, which can also be referred to as energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, EDX. EDS is most often employed in combination with an SEM. The SEM is used to identify a particular location for analysis, and then a beam of electrons or X-rays is directed at the location, and the released X-rays from the sample can be characterized to determine elemental composition at the location. A wide variety of other techniques can be used as well. This is just a partial list. Importantly, differentiating engineered nanomaterials from naturally occurring nanomaterials is hard. There are relatively few studies in the literature to help those performing environmental measurements. Some nanomaterials are composed of elements that may not occur naturally in high concentrations. In those situations, it may be easier to distinguish the engineered nanomaterials based on composition. For example, cadmium selenide quantum dots do not occur naturally, so their presence can only be related to nanotechnology. Identifying a suitable environmental control may be a way to assess levels of engineered nanomaterials. If elevated concentrations of an element in an engineered nanomaterial are found in a sample that is significantly above levels found in control samples taken elsewhere, then the elevation in concentration may be due to the nanomaterial. We saw this earlier in the titanium concentrations measured downstream from a swimming area when compared with the concentrations upstream. The challenge with this approach is often to find a suitable location to take a control sample. To finish this lesson, let's take a look at what is known about engineered nanomaterial concentrations in various environmental compartments. All of these measures, or modeling estimates, were compiled in a study by Gottschalk and co-authors. In this figure and the ones that follow, concentrations predicted by models, or measured concentrations, are presented from a variety of studies separated by nanomaterial. Geometric means of concentrations and the range of results are provided. Bars in green represent modeled results, bars in yellow represent measurements, and bars in orange combine modeling results and measurements. This first figure shows engineered nanomaterial concentrations in surface waters. For nanotitanium dioxide, concentrations are mostly in the range of 10 nanograms per liter to 10 micrograms per liter. Concentrations for other nanomaterials are lower. Concentrations for silver, zinc oxide, and cerium oxide nanoparticles are all predicted to be lower than 1 microgram per liter in surface waters, and mostly lower than 100 nanograms per liter. For carbon nanotubes and fullerenes, surface water concentrations are predicted to be even lower, less than 1 nanogram per liter. Engineered nanomaterial concentrations have been measured and estimated to be higher in the effluent of wastewater treatment plants than in surface waters. This makes sense because some nanomaterials may be released directly into wastewater, such as nanotitanium dioxide and sunscreen being washed off during showers and nanosilver on clothing being liberated during clothes washing. Nanomaterials released into surface waters will be diluted a lot more than those released in wastewater. With the exception of one study that estimated nanotitanium dioxide at concentrations of about 1 mg per liter in wastewater treatment plant effluents, other estimates and several sets of measurements suggest concentrations of approximately 10 micrograms per liter. Concentration estimates and measurements for nanosilver, nanozinc oxide, carbon nanotubes, fullerenes, and cerium oxide nanoparticles are generally lower, with most concentrations in the vicinity of 1 microgram per liter or lower. A similar pattern among the various engineered nanomaterials can be observed for concentrations in wastewater treatment plant biosolids. Nanotitanium dioxide concentrations are generally higher than the concentrations for the other nanomaterials. In one study, concentrations of nanotitanium dioxide were measured to be larger than 1 mg per gram of biosolid. Other measurements and estimates were lower for titanium dioxide but concentrations were still greater than 100 micrograms per gram in several studies. The one study that looked at nanozinc oxide suggested concentrations between 10 and 100 micrograms per gram of biosolid. Concentrations for nanosilver were all below 10 micrograms per gram, 
while concentrations for carbon nanotubes, fullerenes, and cerium oxide nanoparticles were lower than 100 nanograms per gram. There are no measurements of engineered nanomaterials in the sediments of surface waters. Models estimate that nanotitanium dioxide will be at concentrations of 10 milligrams per kilogram or lower in sediments. Carbon nanotube concentrations may be as high as about 1 milligram per kilogram of sediment, according to models. Concentrations of other nanomaterials are likely to be lower. Estimates for engineered nanomaterial concentrations in soils range widely, but they are mostly around 1 milligram per kilogram or lower. Unsurprisingly, soils to which biosolids from wastewater treatment plants have been applied, labeled with the red dots, are expected to have higher concentrations than soils in which nanomaterials have settled through either wet or dry deposition from the atmosphere. Interestingly, cerium oxide nanoparticles are expected to have relatively high concentrations, but this estimate was produced for soils near roadways that may experience contamination from cerium oxide additives in diesel fuel. The last compartment that Gottschalk et al. considered is the atmosphere. Once again, concentrations vary widely among the different studies. However, most of the studies indicate that engineered nanomaterial concentrations in the atmosphere should be about 100 nanograms per cubic meter or lower. While these concentrations are below levels thought to be of concern in occupational settings, we do not know the implications of broader, low-level inhalation exposures to engineered nanomaterials among the general public by way of the natural environment. In summary, engineered nanomaterials are released to the natural environment during product manufacturing, use, and disposal, and the released nanomaterials can be distributed widely throughout the environment. In the natural environment, engineered nanomaterials can be toxic, especially to microorganisms. The sampling and analytical techniques available to us now can be used to characterize engineered nanomaterials. However, differentiating the engineered nanomaterials from natural nanoscale materials present significant challenges during analysis. Finally, it is important to remember that concentrations of engineered nanomaterials in the natural environment are generally expected to be low and considerably lower than concentrations that are likely to be found in workplaces. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training, or METFAST, program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers and does not necessarily represent the official views of the National Institutes of Health. Thank you for watching this lesson.